Bucks are going to win it right at the table. 12-26. Oh, my. Wow. All I can say is wow. It is Blaskowski and a and new D3 record. But it's going to be Quapo, your national champion in the women's 100 meter dash. I mean, I don't really do a lot of thinking. I just let my coach do uh, everything. Look at this, this is what people want to see, the track and field. People don't want to come and watch some boring stuff. <laughs> so like, let's give them something exciting to watch. Uh, there you go, boys, congratulations. Oh, yeah! Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of the U.S. Track and Field and Cross Country Coaches Association, Director of Men's and Women's Track and Field at the University of Georgia, Carol Smith Gilbert. Hello. Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. How's everyone doing? Um, welcome to the 2023 convention of the U.S. Track and Field and Cross Country Coaches Association. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today, and the Mile High City is my city. <laughs> uh, so I personally welcome you, and I'm excited to have you all hardworking and talented coaches visit the Mile High City, and the home of the Denver Broncos, and the home of the George Washington High School Patriots. <laughs> uh, I will say we have a few important things that I, that I think I should mention that have been on my mind, um, and I want to address the current landscape of our sport. As we all know, there are, there's lots of change on the horizon. NIL lawsuits, antitrust lawsuits, Austin, NIL, uh, and more, transfer portal, change how we recruit. What college sports look like today are 180 degrees different than what they look like even two to three years ago. And what they will look like in a matter of one year to 18 months. We all know that. Uh, my coach here in Denver, Colorado was Tony Wells. He was the coach of the Colorado Flyers, very important person in my life, always taught us on his team that we must adapt or die. There's no other way to do it. Change will always happen. It does us no good to complain about what was or what's to come. It's going to happen. The train has already left the station. Track and field saved my life more than once, and I believe it's our responsibility from God as coaches to focus on helping our student athletes become well-rounded human beings. The time we spend complaining that the sky is falling, I'm guilty of it as well, is a missed opportunity to save a life. Track and field is the purest sport with the most diverse population on the planet. We're the first sport, we're gonna be the last sport because our bodies are our implement. And we are the catalyst to any other sport to be important. Of course, we have to be proactive, and that's why we're here in Denver this week, to make our voice heard and to get organized. But based on the number of collegiate records this season alone, and elite performances, and the numerous talented coaches sitting in front of me today, I'm certain we ain't, we ain't going anywhere anytime soon. Track and field and cross country is here to stay. So 
So I would just say spend your time on your team and continue helping young people become stronger, resilient, hardworking, accountable men and women with college degrees, some of whom would never have the opportunity to earn. So that's what I want to say. Um, all right. So before we dive into the excitement of this year's convention, I have some incredible news to share. We forged a dynamic new partnership with Athletic.net and Runnerspace, and its impact is going to be highly visible throughout this event. You can expect professional development sessions that will introduce you to the Athletic.net platform and how it can enhance your coaching, research, and meet operations, which I all think could help us. And, I, and it's not all. Runner Space is rolling out interviews with some of your coaching colleagues in the exhibit area. So don't miss your chance to visit them and explore the rest of our fantastic supporters upstairs in the Colorado Ballroom pre-function area on the third floor. Now let's talk about what's in store for you this week. We've added new features to our convention lineup to make it even more engaging and productive. We've arranged an incredible array of educational opportunities that you won't want to miss. We have over two dozen technical symposiums spread across four different disciplines. Endurance, sprints, hurdles, jumps, and the throws. Many of you already had the chance to dive into these sessions yesterday, and if you haven't, there's still time to catch some of the best insights in the industry. Once again, the technical symposiums are for you, and they are presented by the prestigious Drake Relays. Again, we thank them for their support. But there's more. We once again have a strong program of professional development sessions, high school coaching seminars and assistant coach seminars, and director of operations seminars. We've carefully curated these sessions to cater to your evolving, continuing education. I'm particularly excited to share that in our women in coaching seminar held yesterday, we had a truly special guest, none other than Olympic and multi-time world champion boxer, Katie Taylor who graced us with words of inspiration. It was a moment that exemplified the strength, resilience, and leadership of women in our coaching community. I did a little research, and women represent uh, over 35,000 of our student athletes between divisions one, two, and three. So I charge USTFCCCA and this membership body to identify and develop female leadership within the organization. I also challenge all women coaches to step forward and be leaders so we can hear your voice. Thank you. My last challenge is for all of us to hire more women coaches and develop them to coach their own event groups and to become head coaches. Um, and for those of you Looking to break a sweat? Join your coaching colleagues and members of the United States Marine Corps in an, for an invigorating shakeout run tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. I, I won't be there. <laughs> but I, I respect y'all that are. Meet in the lobby and kickstart your day. Or maybe you can't finish your day. I don't know. As we look ahead, tonight is the night to honor the past. Join us for our Hall of Fame dinner and induction ceremony, hosted by Paul Swangert of NBC Sports, right here in the Adams Ballroom, where we'll celebrate the remarkable accomplishments of our coaching colleagues. A heartfelt thank you goes out to Recortan for sponsoring this memorable evening. Tomorrow night, let loose, but not too much, and have a blast at the Mondo party in the Aurora Ballroom. It will be casino night where you can try your luck for a variety of prizes. It's going to be a night to remember. On Thursday, we'll wrap up our convention with a bang as the Bowerman presentation takes center stage right here in the Adams Ballroom. John Anderson is once again back to host alongside four-time world champion Grant Holloway. And as always, it promised to, promises to be an unforgettable celebration of the past year and incredible finalist slate of athletes. There, before I conclude, please remember to keep your credentials with you all at all times as they grant you access to meal special events and, of course, the convention itself. All right, so let's get ready for an incredible convention filled with learning, networking, and celebrating our coaching community. 
Remember, we aren't just coaches. We are the stewards of our sports programs and universities. We are leaders on our campuses, shaping the future of athletics and the lives of young men and women. Let's make the most of this opportunity together. Thank you, and let's have a fantastic time at the 2023 USTFCCCA Convention. All right. And with that, we now turn to the awards portion of our program, beginning with the National Champion Ring Ceremony presented by Balfour. Today we are recognizing championship staffs from the 22-23 academic year. Now I have the pleasure of, working, of welcoming these collegiate championship staffs to the stage as Scott McClasson of Balfour will present the rings. From the NJCAA 2022 Division III Women's Cross Country National Champions and 2023 Women's Outdoor Track and Field Champions, College of DuPage. Coaches Robert Cervenka, Kenny Brown, and Floyd Turner. Colby Community College with Brady Johnson and Chelsea Johnson. And now College of DuPage, Division III Women's Cross Country National Champion, Women's Outdoor Track and Field National Champions. men's cross country and 2023 men's outdoor track and field national champions Massachusetts Institute of Technology coaches Todd Linder Riley Macon and Derek Russo
2023 Men's Indoor Track and Field National Champions, University of Wisconsin Lacrosse. Coaches Josh Buchholz and Derek Stanley. Two thousand twenty three women's indoor track and field and two thousand twenty three women's outdoor track and field national champions, University of Wisconsin Lacrosse. Coaches Nicholas Davis, Derek Stanley, and Katie Wagner. From NCAA Division II, 2022 Women's Cross Country and 2023 Women's Indoor Track and Field National Champions, Adams State University. Coaches Damon Martin and Sadie Baker, Alec Duncan and Matt Gersick. Two thousand twenty three women's outdoor track and field national champions, Azusa Pacific University, coaches Jack Hoyt, Andrea Blackett, and Sean Smith. Two thousand twenty two men's cross country national champions, Colorado School of Mines, coaches Chris Simers, Mark Husted, and Caleb Ulrich. 2023 Men's Indoor Track and Field and Outdoor Track and Field National Champions, Pittsburgh State University. Coaches Kyle Rutledge and Jesse Miller. 2023 Brian Compton and Megan Elliott. 2022 Women's Cross Country National Champions, North Carolina State University. Coaches Lori Hennis, Raleigh Geiger, and Chad Pearson. 2022 and how about another round of applause for our national championship coaching staffs. Let's give these coaches another round of applause, applause because I don't think people understand, or maybe some of you do, it's extremely hard to win a national championship. Extremely. Everything has to fall into place at the right time. So congratulations, you all. Um, now it's time to present the Jimmy Carnes Distinguished Service Award. This award, bearing the name of the former association executive director, Jimmy Carnes, recognizes individuals who have exemplified extraordinary dedication and commitment to both our association and the sports of cross country and track and field. I'm waiting for Sam here. Coming up on stage is our very own CEO, Sam Seams, who will have the privilege of presenting this distinguished award. This year, the, recipi the recipient of this esteemed accolade is none other than Dr. Ted Bulling from Nebraska Wesleyan University. Ted, we kindly invite you to make your way to the stage. Is he coming? Hey. Boy, this uh, caught me completely off guard. Uh, thank you to Sam and, and the association. 
And um, obviously, I didn't have anything prepared to say. But uh, uh, one thing I've often come back to uh, coaches, whether you're a first year assistant or a 40, 50 plus year veteran, we coach the greatest sport in the world. And we have a tremendous impact on a lot of uh, young men and women. So keep up the good work. It's important. Ted has been a significant contributor to our association for many years, leaving an indelible mark on our shared journey. His pinnacle of service was during his tenure from 2011 to 2013 when he served as the president of the USF CCCA. Notably, he was the first individual from NCAA Division III to be elected as the president of the association. In addition to this, Ted played a pivotal role in the establishment of the Division III Hall of Fame Committee and has also served on our association's Hall of Fame Committee. This year, Ted retired after an illustrious 38-year career and let us once again come together and celebrate recognition of the 2023 recipient of the Jimmy Carnes Distinguished Service Award, Dr. Ted Bullock. Next, we will present the Association's National High School Coach of the Year Awards, presented by the United States Marine Corps for the 2023 academic year. It is my pleasure to welcome to the stage Marine Master Sergeant Christopher McComb, who has a few words to share. There is a shared purpose around what the Marine Corps does and what we are trying to do for our students. The Marines are the tough, the gritty, they're the first in, they're the last out. We've tried to take that same fighting spirit and give it to our team. My name is Cheryl Harris-Curtis. I'm Jim Deeds. My name is Ashley Sword. My name is Jeff Dugdale. These coaches and these educators are incredibly important. Whether they know it or not, they're making an impact on these students. Good morning. On behalf of the United States Marine Corps, I would like to congratulate all five 2022-2023 National Coaches of the Year. As a coach, I understand the commitment and dedication it takes to succeed at the highest levels. As a Marine, I salute you for your leadership, driving your athletes to win internal and external battles on and off the track. You have demonstrated the same fighting spirit that is present in every Marine standing watch for our nation across the globe. The United States Marine Corps is proud to partner with the U.S. Track and Field Cross Country and Coaches Association, and we look forward to cultivating deeper relationships with amazing coaches among your membership. Congratulations again, and Semper Fidelis. And as Coach Carroll stated, we look forward to seeing all of y'all at 6 a.m. for the run. Our first honor ring is the 2022 National Boys Cross Country Coach of the Year from Jesuit High School of New Orleans, Louisiana.
Congrats once again to our honorees and thank you again to the Marines for supporting this great award program. And now I would like to introduce our, introduce our CEO, Sam Seams, to make some comments. Good morning. It's good to see everybody once again. Thanks for coming out, getting together, sharing ideas, and hopefully implementing some. Uh, I want to start uh, by going through and thanking our supporters. Uh, these are companies that do business with your association, uh, put money up uh, to be associated with you, uh, and without them, uh, it would be tougher for your association to work on a daily basis. But those are Athletic, Athletic Net, Balfour, Binance Sports Surfacing, Boost Treadmills, Clell Wade Coaches Directory, Konica USA, Ecor, Elliptico, Garmin, Geo Surfaces, Gill Athletics, Lightspeed Lift, Maxwell Medals and Awards, MF Athletic, Mondo, On Track and Field, Flubber, excuse me, Plubber, RelayBatons.com, Recortan, Runner Space, Smart Tracks, the U.S. Marine Corps, UCS, UCS Spirit, and VS. And I'd like to give a special thanks to MF Athletic for supplying equipment at last night's spy coaching sessions, which was the first time that we've done that, but they supplied all that equipment. So it takes, as usual, family to, a village, I guess it is, to raise a family, and these folks are part of our family. Uh, please visit them as they're here this week. Uh, something I'd like to start out with, uh, I guess there's been a lot of confusion. Uh, I always say confusion is caused by somebody who wants to confuse people. Uh, this subject, there should have been no confusion over. So I'm going to try to make the clearest point that I, that I can. It's been mentioned two or three times that we create a partnership with Athletic Net. But please take note, if you're an NCAA D1, D2, D3 institution, I think this applies to NAI also, is Nothing has changed about the NCAA requirement to upload your results to TFERS at the conclusion of the meet that you host. Nothing has changed about that. Also, there is nothing else connected to that. If you want to use somebody to do your meet, a timer, you want to use somebody to do your entries, whatever you want to do, that's your decision. But nothing has changed about the NCA requirement or how it's done. I just want to make that real clear. I don't think that it's very, uh, very, very complicated. Unfortunately, in the last week, uh, we've seen uh, a group intervene and have closed our coaches out of quite a bit of that access that they had before to complete some functions associated with that. And that's a battle we're just going to have to take up and uh, hold people accountable for. But once again, nothing has changed from an NCA uh, standpoint. Uh, the next item I want to touch on, get a little more positive here is on September 14th this last year, we inducted the association's second collegiate track and field and cross country athlete hall of fame class. And since most of you weren't there, some were here, uh, I'd like to take a moment and share a few of the highlights from that event with you.
here are tonight's inductees. Tonight's host for the evening, Neil Everett. Run faster, jump higher. I got to tell you, these ladies and gentlemen, they weren't just great athletes. They were fabulous athletes. And as we got to spend time with them at the induction this year, also learned they're great human beings, uh, represent our sport extremely well. Uh, the next induction, our third class, uh, even though we've been doing this for 100 plus years, but our third class will go in on June the 3rd uh, this, coming, this coming year. So it's a great event. encourage you to come to it. Uh, this is going to be just a little bit dry, but it's, it's extremely important. So on Tuesday of last week, uh, a letter was sent out to NCA institutions and to uh, those associated like ourselves at the, uh, uh, with, the, with the NCAA by uh, the new NCA president, Charlie Baker. Uh, I think, hopefully, most of you have heard something about this correspondence that went out. Uh, some of you have probably read some of it, uh, probably a few. Uh, I know this group isn't big on reading. Uh, but, uh, but perhaps a few of you read the, read the whole thing. But I want to make sure that this group hears what his message was. This is his first message across, across the board. So bear with me and listen. As you know, we have been reviewing the current state of college athletics for the past several months. During this review, several things have become clear. For hundreds of thousands of young people and for tens of millions over time, college sports are a pathway to a college degree an invaluable learning experience, and a major element in the plan that successfully launches them into adulthood. Billions of dollars are invested annually by colleges and universities in their athletics programs. Their student athletes support systems and student athletes. College sports alone deliver $4 billion in scholarships to hundreds of thousands of young people yearly. Graduation rates for student athletes have risen dramatically over the past 15 years, so much that across every demographic, student athletes graduate at a higher rate than their peers who are not student athletes. More is being done to build on this success. Starting next year, all Division I schools will be required to guarantee the scholarships they offer to student athletes, whether they play their sport or not. Starting next year, all Division I schools will be required to provide up to 10 years of ongoing tuition assistance to scholarship athletes until they complete their degrees. Starting next year, all Division I schools will be required to provide mental health services to student athletes consistent with the latest best practices. Starting next year, student athletes across all three divisions will have access to a nationwide injury insurance program that will provide two years of primary and secondary health insurance coverage if they get injured playing a sport for their school and are still in active treatment when they graduate or their eligibility has expired. Looking ahead, financial and operational differences among colleges and universities across all three divisions and even within Division I among the colleges and universities in Division I are significant and poised to grow. Across Division I schools, Excuse me, across Division I, schools spend between $5 million and $250 million annually on their athletics programs. 59 Division I schools spend over $100 million annually on their athletic program. 
Another 32 Division I schools spend over $50 million annually on their athletics program. An additional 259 Division I schools spend less than $50 million, and of those, 144 Division I schools spend less than $25 million on their athletics program. Surprisingly, the schools that spend the most on college athletics rely on virtually no student fees to support their programs. On average, 1.8% of a A5, autonomy 5, athletics budget is paid for by student fees, while 14%, 18% of the budgets for the remainder of Division I schools are funded by student fees. 98% of Division II and Division III schools spend less than $20 million annually on their athletics programs. Like most of their Division I colleagues, these schools make an investment in sports. And by doing so, they make an investment in the educational experience of their student athletes. No one could possibly conclude that most of these schools make money on college athletics. Despite the wide disparity in revenues and spending, the lessons over 500,000 student athletes learn by participating in intercollegiate athletics and undeniably similar, student athletes learn how to put their own interests aside in pursuit of a higher and more challenging team-based objective. They learn how to get back up when they get knocked down. They learn how to push through adversity to achieve personal and team-based goals and objectives. They learn how to master their craft, one that often requires hours and hours of teaching, coaching, and practice. They learn how to win with grace and lose with dignity. They learn the power and importance of process in both directions. Success is a process, and so is failure. They also learn how to, excuse me, they also learn how to lean on their teammates and coaches in personal pursuits of excellence in the classroom and on the field of play. However, the growing financial gap between the highest resource colleges and universities and other schools in Division I has created a new series of challenges. The challenges are competitive as well as financial and are complicated further by the intersection of name, image, and likeness opportunities for student athletes and the arrival of the transfer portal. The contextual environment is equally challenging as the courts and other public entities continue to debate reform measures that in many cases would seriously damage parts or all of college athletics. Therefore, it is time for us, the NCAA, to offer our own forward-looking framework. This framework must sustain the best elements of the student-athlete experience for all student-athletes, build on the financial and organizational investments that have positively changed the trajectory of women's sports, and enhance the athletic and academic experience for student athletes who attend the highest resource colleges and universities. To deliver on this framework, we need to make several fundamental changes. First, we should make it possible for all Division I colleges and universities to offer student athletes any level of enhanced educational benefits they deem appropriate. Second, Rules should change for any Division I school at their choice to enter into name, image, and likeness licensing opportunities with their student athletes. These two changes will enhance the financial opportunities available to all Division I student athletes. They will also help level what is fast becoming a very unlevel playing field between men and women student athletes because schools will be required to abide by existing gender equity regulations as they make investments in their athletics programs. Third, 
a subdivision comprised of institutions with the highest resources to invest in their student athletes should be required to do two things. When within the framework of Title IX, invest at least $30,000 per year into an enhanced educational trust fund for at least half of the institution's eligible student athletes. Commit to work with their peer institutions in this subdivision to create rules that may differ from the rules in place for the rest of Division I. Those rules could include a wide range of policies, such as scholarship commitment, roster size, recruitment, transfers, or NIL. I, this is Charlie Baker, President, I look forward to hearing from members and student athletes as we move ahead, but moving ahead in this direction has several benefits. First, it significantly enhances the NCAA's ability to provide world-class educational and athletics experiences to the most elite student athletes. Second, it enables the continued investment in women's sports and women's student athletes at a level that compares with future investments in men's sports. Third, it gives the educational institutions within the most visibly, the most, <coughs> excuse me. Third, it gives the educational institutions the most visibility, the most financial resources, and the biggest brands an opportunity to choose to operate with a different set of rules that more accurately reflect their scale and their operating model. Fourth, it gives colleges and universities that are not sure about which direction they should move in an opportunity to do more for their student athletes than they do now without necessarily having to perform at the financial levels required to join the subdivision. Fifth, it gives other schools in Division I the ability to do whatever might make sense for them and for their student athletes within a more permissive, more supportive framework for student athletes than the one they operate in now. Sixth, it provides student athletes in the most competitive and well-resourced part of Division I with significant educational benefits that they can use to launch themselves once they enter graduate or research the end of their, or reach the end of their athletics eligibility and it does so in a way that respects and comp compiles the, within the rules concerning governing gender equity. Seventh, it gives the schools most impacted by collectives, the transfer portal and NIL, the opportunity to create rules, programming and resources that are in the best interest of the vast majority of their student athletes instead of just a few. Eight, it maintains the existing NCAA national championship model across existing Division I sports, except FBS football, which continues to operate under the rubric of the college football playoff. Ninth, it provides an operating model the NCAA and its member institutions can incorporate into ongoing discussions with Congress about the future of college athletics. Finally, it kickstarts a long overdue conversation among the membership that focuses on the differences that exist between schools, conferences, and divisions, and how to create more permissive and flexible rules across the NCA that put student athletes first. Colleges and universities need to be more flexible, and the NCA needs to be more flexible too. It also gives the NCA a chance to propose a better way to support student athletes at the highest revenue schools by providing significant financial support to student athletes in revenue positive and non-revenue sports alike. We look forward to continuing this conversation. If you have feedback on this proposal, please, please email projected or project project P R O J E C T D one at nca.org or provide comments. I read that letter because it's very significant. Two, you need to know it because that is the mindset that is going on. 
And thirdly, I would say that if that correspondence doesn't say there's going to be changes, I don't know what else does. That was followed by President Baker's comments a couple of days later at a public conference where he said, we've historically been reactive to changing a future course for college athletics. We need to really step up and own this and show people that we can actually govern college athletics in reorganizing it needs to be done differently than it was done in the past. Quote, get stuff done. Uh, you can take that for what, it's, for what it's worth. I take especially the comment, get stuff done, as a call to action. As a lot, if not all of you know, uh, I've talked about change ever since I've been in this position, and you're probably tired of hearing it, and as long as I'm in this position, you're gonna get more tired because I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna drop it. Uh, but I will say if, uh, and I've probably had more than one failure since I've been in this job, but the one definite failure that I've had since I've been in this position is to get our coaching membership to understand, and Carol touched on this, change is going to happen. You either adapt or you get left behind. We as a sport, I'm not talking about your training. God knows you've adapted. How you communicate, God knows you've adapted. I'm talking about our sport. Our sport of track and field and cross country, we haven't adapted to change, to new times, to new ways to do things. I know it's hard. Change is hard. We don't like to change. But you have to if you're going to stay in the game. I don't know. I mean, so I'd like to see the hands of everybody who's probably used a typewriter this morning. Huh? Anybody? I can't quite see. I'm, I'm doubting if there's many. They're gone. That was a major part of communication and corresponding for decades. It's gone. The typewriter, the people who own those companies who produce them, and so on and so forth, they did not adapt. They went away. It's not good. It's, it's not a good place. It's not a good place to be. Uh, I, uh, I'm kind of going to leave it there. We've we got to change. This is a great sport we have. Sports. There's, there's two of them. Track and field and cross country. Uh, we, I, can, I don't have enough, uh, I don't know how to say, say this because I'm not an elegant speaker. We need to make sure they're, we need to make sure they're around. The, the kids are doing their part. You go to a meet, as Carol even mentioned this, we're having new collegiate records. We're having records broken that were, were 40, 50 years old. The kids are doing things now that we as adults have not been able to screw it up so much that they still can't rise to the top. You know, we need to perform like the student athletes perform. And something that someone told me this morning, I'd never heard this before, but it resonated with me, and I only have one other thing to say after that. We shouldn't use students to win games. We should use games to use students. I'd never thought about that, but man, that hit me. That's what it's about. We fear use track and field to win the students over, to help them. So I'll end by saying this. We should and need to 
protect and advance our sports to ensure that the opportunities that our sports today provide for students and for youth are still in place so they're there for the future students, the future youth, and well after all of us are dead and gone. Have a good week and thanks for listening to me. Carol, would you come back up and close out? Okay, Sam, I, I fully agree. I think that's important. As I said earlier, adapt or die. A couple words that I, I noticed in that letter, I, I did read it last week myself, were the, the NCAA uh, president, flexible. Flexible something that's flexible bends. I think we figure out which direction they're going and then figure out how, it, how we can use that to, to put our, for, our sport forward. That's all we got. So let's work on that starting now. <laughs> um, thank you, Sam. As we close, I have a couple of reminders to share. To begin, I want to inform you um, of our future convention schedule. No one cheer because Denver's a great place, <laughs> although I don't live here. Next year, we will return to Florida <laughs> and the Orlando Grand Lakes Resort December 16th to the 19th. Please be sure to visit our supporters at the exhibit booths. They, please reciprocate their support by visiting and purchasing their products. They are a key element to the association's financial stability. Thank you. And one final thing. Lunch today is sponsored, in Binance Sports, by, is sponsored by Binance Sports Surfacing and will be served in the Aurora Ballroom. That's on the second floor, other side. Correct. Next floor. Uh, which is upstairs on the second floor past the coffee bar. When leaving, attendants will direct you to the ballroom. And with that, the 2023 opening session is now dismissed. Thank you for coming.